الحمد لله رب العالمين نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهد الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اما بعد فقال صلى الله عليه وسلم كما اخرج امام الترمذي قال حديث الصحيح خلافة في أمتي ثلاثون سنة ثم ملوك بعد ذلك ولكن في الرواية أخرج إمام الطبراني مرفوعا فقال أول هذا الأمر نبوة والرحمة ثم يكون خلافة ورحمة ثم يكون ملكا ورحمة ثم ملك عارضا ثم ملك جبرية أخرج إمام أحمد أيضا في حديث حسن we begin the discussion regarding the Khilafah of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu. And this uh, dars today is going to be an introduction to who was Muawiyah and his virtues and the background how, inshallah, on how he became the Khalifa and things. But before we get there, we want to address the hadith that we've been mentioning where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has told us that the Khilafah will be in this Ummah upon the methodology of Nabuwa for 30 years. And then there will be kingdom after that. Tayyip. Now when we look at the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and Hassan, radiallahu anhum, this comes out to be about 30 years. And this is no doubt a righteous uh, time of Khilafah. Uh, but now when we get to the time of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, does that mean that this is no longer a righteous Khilafah? So in this we mention another hadith, when we look at a hadith we always look at it in the context of other ahadith. Imam al-Tabrani has mentioned from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa that the beginning of this affair, yani this ummah, will be a nabuwa wa rahma, yani prophethood and mercy. Yani the Prophet of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a rahma lil alameen. Rasulullah is rahmatul lil alameen. Yani this was a, it began upon prophethood, this ummah, and a mercy for all of mankind. Tayyib. And after that, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, thumma yakuna khilafa wa rahma. After that, there will be khilafa and rahma. Yani the khilafa of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali, and so on, they were also a mercy. Then the Prophet ﷺ says, ثُمَّ يَكُونَ مُلْكًا وَرَحْمًا yani Those muluk that came after that, they are still considered a mercy for the ummah and for mankind. Tayyib, inshallah, as we go through these series, we'll discuss the difference in what is mulk, Yani from a kingdom and what is a khilafa and what is the difference between the two? A king could run his khilafa like sharia, yani with the Quran, with a hadith, with hudud, all of that. But the way of, of how a leader succeeds another is where you will find a difference, and inshallah we'll discuss this. But no doubt, according to this hadith, uh, the time period that Muawiyah radiallahu anhu ruled this ummah was a rahma, was a mercy. Because this is right after that period of 30 years. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam says in the rawaya, again this is Tabrani, Imam Ahmad also has a Hassan rawaya for this. He says after that there will be mulk but aadan, yani there will just be a, a grab for wealth. And that is after the time when the Sahaba have finished and we see the Tabi'un and the Taba Tabi'un and what happens after that. And the Prophet ﷺ tells the same hadith, Thumma mulk Jabariya. After that, there will be a kingdom by force which the ulama have explained to be dictatorships. And then Alhamdulillah, at the end of all of these ahadith, we know that the Khilafah ala manhaj al nabuwa upon the methodology of prophethood will return towards the end of time. And inshallah, this will be before and during the time of Mahdi alayhi salam. Tayyib, now when we talk about 
the Khilafa and those ulema that, that mentioned that the Khilafa will return. Some of the people said that this was a, yani, a indication towards the Khilafa of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. That the Khilafa's return will be the time of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. But this is a ba'id, this is a weak narration. Why? Because Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is very close to the time of the Khilafah of Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman, Ali radiallahu anhum and the stages between them have not passed. The second call is that there will be righteous Khulafah that will come throughout the history of the Muslim Ummah. Inshallah this is true. And the third, which is the correct opinion, is that the return of the Khilafah will be towards the end of the time of this Ummah through righteous leaders and then the final, the twelfth Khalifa being Mahdi alayhi salam towards the end of time, towards the signs of the Day of Judgment. Tayyib, so we begin understanding that the reign of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was called a rahmah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi salam in the Sahih Hadith. Now, in preparation for this dars, we looked at a lot of different narrations. And I just want to always give this warning. People pick up books without takhrij, without the checking of ahadith, without looking at the authenticity or weakness of ahadith. In that, we find a lot of fabricated ahadith, a lot of mawdu' or yani, lies that have been brought into the books of history and into the books of hadith in either going to ghulu' yani, to overly praising Ali or Muawiyah radiallahu anhuma, or fabricating against Ali or Muawiyah radiallahu anhuma. We the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we don't take a hadith from political bias. Rather we look at what is authentically established and we accept those virtues for anybody that have authentically been established. So when you do further read or if you ever listen to other durus and things, be very careful that we stick to the authentic narrations because in this bab, especially with the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and then after him, uh, when we talk about Yazid and Karbala and what happened, there's a lot of fabrications. I was looking at ahadith, even in the books that are usually relied upon books in tarikh, but when you start looking at the Sanad, you find Kadhab and Rafida and Mu'tazila and others who are unacceptable narrators of ahadith. Tayyib, the third thing to mention before we get into uh, Muawiyah radiyanu himself is the usul of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah of the Muslim Ummah with regard to the Sahaba. And this is very important. Yani, as Imam al Suyuti, Imam ibn Kathir, Imam and Alema across the board have said, usul in the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, the, the principle with the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah regarding the Sahaba. كُلُّ أَصْحَابُ النَّبِي صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمْ عَادِلُونَ yani All of the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that we know to be from the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There were those that were munafiqoon and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he explained about some of them and we discussed some of them in the earlier durus. Those are not considered to be from the Sahaba. But those that are from the Ashab of Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, those whose virtues established in the Qur'an and Sahih Ahadith, we consider all of them to be of good moral character. We don't criticize any of them. What we do do is present and study what is authentically established according to the rules of Mustala al-Hadith, yani according to the rules of Ilm al-Rijal. We present, but we don't criticize. When we look at this principle, it is based in the Authentic hadith, the hadith is Hassan li ghayrihi, whereas the Prophet sallallahu said, Allah, Allah. And when he say Allah, Allah, mean to have, to fear Allah, or be mindful for Allah, bi ashabi, yani, or fi ashabi, yani, regarding my companions. What does the Prophet say? Be mindful of Allah, regarding my ashab. La takhadu, yani, do not take them as targets. Yani, don't take them where you start yani, shooting arrows or, or, or hurling insults towards any of them. فَمَنْ أَحَبَّهُمْ فَبِحُبِّي 
احبهم فمن ابغضهم فببغضي ابغضهم ومن اداهم فقد اداني what does the prophet sallam tell us that whoever loves the sahaba again we mentioned this is a reliable narration he said whoever loves the sahaba he loves them because of my love because they love me so he loves them why do we love Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and Ali radiallahu anhum and Muawiyah and, and Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Amr ibn al-As and all of these great Sahaba? Why do we love them? Because of the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And why do we love Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Because of the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Prophet is saying whoever loves the Sahaba and we love the Sahaba, then he loves them because of the love of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet said, Man abghadahum, whoever hates them, whoever has a disdain for them, for the Sahaba, is because they hate me. And this is something ajib. Like some people today, they claim to be lovers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, but then they curse the wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They curse the best companion, the closest of the people to him, Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman and others. How? Imagine one of you. I mean, one of you. Or me. Somebody tells you I love you. You're my favorite person in the whole world. But then they curse your wife. Then they accuse your wife without proof. They say they want to take your wife out of the qabr and, and, and have her whipped and things like this. They curse your closest companions who loved you, who supported you, who helped you. Nobody would accept that to be a love. If you curse my family, if you could curse my honor, if you curse my wife, if you curse my friends, my companions who have been, through, been with me through harsh and, and hard times and, and, and all of that, then no doubt I'm going to say your love for me is fake. Because if you loved me, then you would love who I love. And that's why we love who Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa loves. And when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked, who is the most beloved to you out of all of mankind? Who did he say? In the Sahih Hadith, Aisha radiyana. Now, interestingly, I was discussing with the Rafidi this issue. And we asked him about, about a narration. So he presented a narration about the Fadail of Ali ibn Abi Talib. And no doubt we accept that Fadila. From the same book, with the same quality and caliber narrators, I presented this narration to him, but they wouldn't accept it. Because politically, it didn't work with their agenda. This is not the way of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. We are truth seekers. So when Rasulullah was asked, who is the most beloved to? He said, Aisha radiyanha. He said, what about min rijal from the men? He said, Abu, her father. The most beloved people to the Prophet wasallam from mankind, I mean, not including Allah, from mankind, Aisha radiyallahu anha wa Abu Bakr radiyallahu If somebody curses these two, calls them munafiqoon, calls them kuffar, calls them yani, all kinds of horrible names and says Aisha finnar, do you think this would please Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa What love is that? A woman that Allah bore witness to her purity, to her caliber in the Qur'an. Subhanallah. So when we make these usul, we make them based on the authentic ahadith. And Rasulullah sallallahu said in the end of the hadith, that whoever shows animosity, whoever is an enemy to my ashab, is an enemy to me. Whoever is an enemy to the sahaba, is an enemy to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this hadith, as I mentioned, for those who want to look it up, you can find it in Fadal al-Sahaba of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. Imam Bukhari has it in his Tariq al-Kabir, not in his Sahih, but in his Tariq. Imam al-Tirmidhi, Ibn Hibban, others have recorded Ibn Hibban, credited to be Sahih. Imam al-Tirmidhi as Hassan, and I would say it's Hassan li ghayrihi, it's a reliable narration. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. When we look at who he was as a person, his name is Muawiyah. Ibn Abi Sufyan. Abi Su- Abu Sufyan was his father. Abu Sufyan's name is Sakhr. But he was famous by the kunya, Abu Sufyan. When we put it in the name, we put Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. It doesn't become Abu because it becomes Mudaf ilayh. 
But his name was Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, his kunya, his nickname that was given to him was Abu Abdul Rahman. Abu Abdul Rahman was his kunya. His father was Sakhar ibn Harab ibn Umayyah ibn Abdul Shams ibn Abdul Manaf. When we look at his lineage at Abdul Manaf, he, his lineage matches that of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he, from there onwards, he has the same lineage as Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyib, he had a son named Abdul Rahman, and that is where his kunya Abu Abdul Rahman came from. His father, Abu Sufyan, was also a Sahabi. As you know, he became Muslim in the later part of Islam, after the Fath of Mecca. Muawiyah radiyan, as we will discuss, he became Muslim before his father. He also has a brother named Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan. There is a son that he has named Yazid who is not a Sahabi and we'll discuss him. But he also has a brother named Yazid who is the same father, Abu Sufyan. So he has a brother named Yazid and he has a son named Yazid. His brother, his father, his mother, all of them were from the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu His brother Yazid was known for his piety as well. And he was made in charge by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa during the lifetime of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and by Abu Bakr radiyanhu and we'll discuss about him a little bit inshallah coming up. Yazid, his brother, as we find in al Isaba and things, was known to be from the awliya amongst the sahaba. And he's somebody whose dua was accepted, a very pious man. That's why I know there is the son of Muawiyah named Yazid. But I also want to let you know that there are many sahaba named Yazid. Yani, just because somebody names their child Yazid, people say, oh, why would you name your child Yazid? Yazid was not a Sahabi. It's because they're ignorant. Many Sahaba were named Yazid. So you should know this. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was from Banu Umayyah. Yani this is a, a, a group from, or a sub-tribe from Al Quraysh. And we know that many of the great Sahaba were from Banu Umayyah, including Uthman radiallahu anhu and others. Banu Umayyah's rule of the Muslim Ummah. We, we had the Khilafah from the time of the Prophet sallallahu who was the leader of the Ummah, obviously. Then there was Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Then there was Umar radiallahu anhu. Then there was Uthman radiallahu Now, Uthman radiallahu is Banu Umayyah. But according to what is correct in the Islamic books of history, the rule of Banu Umayyah does not begin with Uthman. Because at the time of Uthman, the next to become a leader did not necessitate to be from Banu Umayyah. That is a kingdom, yani when, you, when you tie it to a family. Now, when we look at Muawiyah radiyanhu, some of the ulama of Islam have said that he was the first of Banu Umayyah. Others said even at his time, this was not a kingdom because he had instructed himself that if he dies, Hassan ibn Ali radiallahu anhu would be Khalifa after him. And he did not say somebody from Banu Umayyah would be Khalifa after me. So most likely Banu Umayyah began after him from the time of Yazid, his son. But khair, I mean, this is the, uh, still a time that's called Rahmah by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Tayyib, when we talk about Banu Umayyah, um, I will just mention a little bit about Banu Umayyah because we're introducing uh, this concept of Muawiyah radiyanu and so on. Banu Umayyah, sometimes people historically look at them with a harsh light because in their time, a lot of luxuries came to the Muslim Ummah. And a lot of the zuhud that was known in the past left. But this is not something that should be taken as harsh. I mean, times change, things change. Uh, and no doubt, many pious rulers came to this Muslim Ummah through Banu Umayyah. Uh, if we look at Banu Umayyah, if we take Muawiyah or Yazid to be the first of them, you have Marwan after him, you have, uh, you have Muawiyah ibn Yazid after him, then you have Marwan ibn Hakam after him, then you have Abdul Malik ibn Marwan after him, then you have Walid ibn Abdul, Mar uh, Abdul Malik after him, then you have Suleiman ibn Abdul Malik after him, and then who do you have? You have Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. I saw somebody who was writing a very critical and Arabic article about Banu Umayyah 
And then they were praising Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Uh, apparently, they didn't realize that Umar ibn Abdul Aziz is also from Banu Umayyah. And the ulama of Islam are at a consensus of the piety of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And many of the ulama have called him the sixth righteous Khalifa. Uh, some of them saying even the fifth, but obviously with Hassan ibn Ali, we would say the sixth. But he was also Banu Umayyah. And so on. And then we have Banu Abbas. And inshallah, we'll discuss that later in the durus. Regarding Muawiyah radiallahu anhu and his physical characteristics from the Sahih Ahadith, we know he was light-skinned. Yani he was of lighter complexion. He was a very tall man. And no doubt, according to all of the historic sources we can find, he was a heavy set man. MashaAllah, he enjoyed eating. And uh, yani this is something that uh, there's nothing wrong with. Yani, alhamdulillah, uh, many people, they enjoy eating a lot. Uh, Muawiyah radiyan was from them. Now, many of the people who are who have uh, a, a hatred for Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, they use some of these Sahih narrations about him being yani, uh, heavy set and having a large belly and things to criticize him. Not realizing that the same can be said for Ali radiallahu anhu. Right? As we mentioned, yani not through one narration, but through many narrations that strengthen each other. From the books of the Ahl Sunnah, yani, we find that Ali radiyan was also, yani, even though he was very physically strong, and so was Muawiyah, but yani, he was somebody with a larger belly. Some people think of the Sahaba to be as if they were like uh, characters from a, a comic book. You know, when you draw a comic book, you can make somebody as muscular as you want, you know, Superman and, and, and this, you can just, every muscle is just defined. They weren't like that. They were humans like us. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took them to such a level due to their sacrifice, due to their love for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not all of them were handsome. Not all of them were tall. Not all of them were muscular. Not all of them were physically able. Some of them like Julaibib radiallahu anhu and others, they were physically disabled. But look at what they were able to accomplish. What have we accomplished even though we have physical abilities? Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, he was known when he used to give khutbah, he would wear a brownish turban. And in the hadith that mentioned, they said he would, he, would, he would seem very handsome with it, with a strong build. So even though he was heavy set, physically he was strong. And he was known for Hilam. Yani he was very Halim. Yani he was not quick to anger. Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu in the authentic narration, when he heard some of the people praising uh, Qisra of Rome, yani, uh, uh, the Qaisar of Rome, the king of Rome, he told them that we have the Qaisar of the Arab, which is Muawiyah, going to fight them, yani, to praise Muawiyah radiyanhu, that he would be an able opponent for the king of Rome. And alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave many victories to Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu against the Romans uh, under his leadership. He was also uh, known to be intelligent, uh, an able writer, and we'll talk about that inshallah as well. He used to dye his beard with henna and khatam, yani, which was a darker mix, not black, because black has been forbidden in a hadith. But when you take henna, which is very orangish, according to the sunnah method, you're supposed to mix the darker khatam with it and then dye. Some people, they dye straight from henna, which brings a very bright orange color. This is also not what we find in a hadith. Rather, what we find in a hadith is that the henna was mixed with khatam, so it was not black, but it wasn't orange. And because this is from the Sunnah, as we know from when Abu Quhafa at Fatah al makkah was told by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Muawiyah Radiyan used to dye his beard as well. Um, and he used to be very precise in his word. What was said about him is when he would give a speech, he would use few words and convey great meaning. When he would write a letter, he would use few words and convey a great meaning. He was born five years before Nabuwa. And before the prophethood of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, five years قبل النبوة. So at the time when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam performed the hijra from Mecca to Medina, he was around 18 years of age. He was not Muslim at the time of hijra. Around the sixth year after the hijra of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam from Mecca to Medina, when Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam came, 
and the Muslims, they gave the bay'ah to Rasulullah sallallahu sallam at Hudaybiyah. According to Ibn Kathir and Ibn Sa'ad and others, this is when Muawiyah became Muslim. Secretly from his own father. Abu Sufyan was still a staunch enemy of Islam at that time. Radiallahu anhu. So Muawiyah radiallahu out of his love for Islam, he became Muslim even not telling his own father. And we know that to be true because as mentioned in Sahih al-Bukhari and others, other books of hadith, in the seventh year of the Hijri of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa when Rasulullah came to make the qada to Mecca, it was Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan that shaved the Mubarak head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa This is a great honor that was given to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. So this Imam al-Bukhari and others, they said in, Kitab, uh, in Tariq al-Kabir, that, uh, and this hadith is in Sahih al-Bukhari, but the explanation in Tariq al-Kabir, that no doubt he had already been a Muslim, because this is before the Fath of Mecca, and you would not have a mushrik shaving the head of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa And not, no doubt that he had already been given a great close relationship with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa because this was a great honor that every Sahabi wanted to have. So this honor was given to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and this is before Fath of Mecca. In the eighth year of Hijri, when the Fath Mecca came, at that time, Muawiyah radiyan came, became public with his Islam after him inviting his father to Islam. He was one of the people that reached out to his own father, Abu Sufyan, and his mother, Hinda, radiallahu anhum, to become Muslim. When they became Muslim, he also became and he opened about his Islam. At that time, many Muslims had their Islam, uh, and Muawiyah Radiyan was one of them. He accompanied Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from that moment till the death of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He, SubhanAllah, there's something beautiful about the Sahaba. When they became Muslim, when they had such an opportunity, they would dedicate their life to Islam. And he didn't say, okay, I'm Muslim, but I gotta go back, I got tijara, I got this, I got that. At Fath of Mecca, he told Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I'm with you wherever you go. And he accompanied Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam into Hunayn, into the Battle of Hunayn, and fought alongside Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and spent a lot of his own wealth, as Ibn Kathir, Ibn Hajar, Asqalani, and Ali Saba, and others have mentioned, that he took from his own wealth and spent it, fi sabilillah, and he left Mecca dedicated to the service of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, staying with him in Medina. He was assigned by Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to take care of guests and to educate them when they came to Medina. One of the responsibilities of the Sahaba after the Fath of Mecca, when, when uh, as we know from the Quran, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ When the Fath of Mecca came, and huge numbers of people started to enter the fold of Islam, huge delegations would come to Medina, there was a very important task to educate them in Islam. This responsibility overall was given to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Muawiyah radiallahu anhu took the people, ashab al suf the people that used to live in the masjid, and he told them that since you are not out yani, farming with the Ansar or trading with the Muhajireen and you are here, you will not sit in the masjid, you will be responsible for this. He assigned uh, shifts for them to greet guests, teach them salah, teach them Quran, teach them fiqh. And he made a, a you could say, a university or, or a school system for people to come and learn Islam. Muawiyah Radiyan was responsible for the uh, ta'am wal qiyam, the taking care of the food and the residences for the people visiting Medina. In the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi they did not have hotels or things like this. Rather, the Muslims would open their houses. When the guests would come, the Muslims would open their house. And this is the haq of the guests. At least for three days, it's their haq. It's not like you're doing them a favor. And that's why some of the ulema said one of the early bid'at we saw in the ummah were hotels. Yani, wallahu alam. But uh, this is something that we see we've lost in the ummah today, is to make ikram of duyuf. But Muawiyah radiyanhu would then distribute the guests of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to the houses of different sahaba and make sure that they are fed and taken care of. With this, yani we see an important point. 
And I want to make a يعني, uh, point for us to take lessons in our life. One person can't do it all. I and mean, sometimes you have one person and people just assume that one person is going to do everything. That's not the way it works. Even Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as one person, he couldn't do it all. It took other sahaba to take on these responsibilities. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa would give them these responsibilities. And this is how the ummah was able to function properly. Another responsibility given to Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, and no doubt this is authentically established throughout books of hadith. Uh, before I mention it, I will mention some of the books just to let you know that this isn't something يعني, I just picked up from one book of tarikh. In the Musnad Imam Ahmad, with a Sahih narration, this was reported from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Imam al Zahabi has said it's also authentically established from Ibn Abbas and others. And this has been mentioned in the Musannaf Ibn Abi Razak and uh, uh, Ibn Abi Shayba and Abdul Razak and others that Muawiyah radiyanhu was the katib of wahi. He used to write down the wahi. Now interestingly, many of the Rafidah do not accept these narrations. But who is the Rawi? I mentioned it. Ibn Abbas. Muawiyah didn't say I wrote down wahi. Ibn Abbas. Who the Rafidah claim to love. They claim to accept his hadith. But when the hadith here, I have the hadith, all of the rawat are from Ahlul Bayt. Beginning with Ibn Abbas. Radiallahu anhu. But they don't accept it. And which shows they don't want to follow the truth. The narration that Imam al Dhabi brings is also from Ibn Abbas. The one that Imam Ahmad brings is also from Ibn Abbas. Even though it's been reported by other Sahaba as well, Amr ibn As and others. But I mentioned this on, on purpose. And what does it say? Sahih hadith. Kana Muawiyah katib al-wahi. Muawiyah then was the one who used to write down the wahi. The, the narration in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, Ibn Abbas radiyan says, that the Rasulullah told him, id'i, yani call for me, li Muawiyah. Yani call for me Muawiyah. Wa kana katibuhu. Yani he used to write for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa fi riwaya katib al-wahi. What does that tell us? He was also the one that used to write rasail, letters from Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi to the different Arab tribes. Um, other imma and ulema, they have in their books of Jam al Quran have also mentioned this. But these narrations I mentioned because they have sanad, and they have chains of narrations that you can find in Jam al Quran or Dalaymi and others. They have also mentioned this as well, but. Uh, these ahadith have asani. Muawiyah radiallahu anhu was also from the people that was instrumental in collecting the Quran. Even though the one who was responsible for it was Zayd ibn Harith and the legend that he had. But he reached out to all of the sahaba that used to write down the Quran. Many of the ayat of Quran were written down by Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And because Zayd ibn Thabit radiyan, whose usul was, there had to be two written uh, yani records per ayah. Many of those came from Muawiyah radiyallahu anhu. Muawiyah radiyan also dedicated himself to jihad. We find that yani, uh, many, many of the battles from the time of Fath Makkah till the death of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and throughout the Khilafah of Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman, Radiallahu uh, anhum, you find Muawiyah radiyanhu in the forefront of jihad. In fact, many of the historians, including some non Muslim historians, have said that Muawiyah radiyan had a greater impact against the Romans than Abu Bakr and Umar Uthman. Yani, uh, or Ali radiyan as well. Meaning, Abu Bakr and Umar Uthman and Ali radiyanhum, they were khulafa, they were in Medina, they were, they were, they were yani, sending out the armies. But who was foot, yani, boots on ground? In Sham, Muawiyah radiyan. From very early time, and he was very successful in his jihad against the Romans. Tayyib, now when we find these narrations, no doubt that Muawiyah radiyan was praised by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well, and we'll talk about some of the ahadith about his fada'il coming up. No doubt he was given the responsibility to write down the Qur'an. No doubt he was given the responsibility to write down letters from Rasulullah going out to the different tribes of the Arab. 
He was given the responsibility of, of keeping the guests and educating them. From somebody who was given all of this, and who was praised and put in, in, in a place of authority by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa we say those who curse or speak ill about Mu'awi radiallahu anhu, or those who curse or speak ill of Ali radiallahu anhu, have all gone astray. They are people that have gone against the Qur'an itself, because we know the Sahaba to be those blessed in the Qur'an. They go against what Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has taught us. Rasulullah sallallahu would not assign writing of Qur'an to somebody who was not trustworthy, or writing of letters to, to the Arab tribes of Da'wah who was not trustworthy or taking care of these things. He stayed with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi till the time of his death. In the Khilafah, or during the Khilafah of Abu Bakr as-Siddiq radiallahu anhu, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, the brother of Muawiyah radiallahu who became Muslim before Muawiyah radiallahu a very pious Sahabi as well, also the son of Abu Sufyan, was sent as the Amir from Abu Bakr radiallahu to fight in Sham. Muawiyah radiallahu was sent with him. Even though Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, who became Muslim first, was in charge, Muawiyah radian was a general, and he had his own battalion, and he was sent responsible for his own unit to fight the Romans. At that time, if we look at the battles, Muawiyah radian had great successes against the Romans in the time of Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Continuing on, during the Khilaf of Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, he became a shaheed through the, the uh, ta'un, yani through the plague. And Rasulullah said about the one who is patient and does not flee the plague is a shaheed. Many people curse Yazid ibn Abi Sufyan, even though we know from the words of Rasulullah sallallahu he's a shaheed. So yani, he, when he became a shaheed, Umar ibn Khattab, and just very early on in the Khilaf of Umar radiallahu anhu, he assigned Muawiyah radiallahu anhu to take his place. From that time until the Khilafah of Muawiyah radiallahu himself, he ruled Sham for 20 years as a governor and then 20 years as a ruler. And he, this tells you something. Not only was he successful because all of the fitan, all of the uprisings, all of the, the khawariji problems and things, they came in Iraq, they came in Misr, they came in... You didn't see them in Sham. In Sham, of course, there weren't any, some problems here and there. The Romans would try to cause problems. But the people of Sham, they loved Muawiyah. The ulema of tarikh have said, one, he was known for his piety. He was known to be a pious man. Second, he was known for being very organized. I mean, the way he ran his government as a governor under the Khalifa first and as a ruler later was in an excellent manner. So the people were pleased. So you didn't have a lot of I mean, uprisings at that time from there as well. Third, he was a person of hilam. He didn't get angry quickly. Fourth, he was known for being wise. Fifth, he knew who to put in charge and who not to. And he chose his subordinates well. He was loved by the people of Sham, who united behind him. And for him to have ruled Sham for 40 years without problems shows you that he was يعني, a very able person. When we look at the Khilaf of Osman, uh, he kept Muawiyah uh, in his place because of the good job that he had done. Even though and Muawiyah radiyanhu offered to step down to Uthman radiyanhu because Uthman radiyan used to change governors a lot. He used to change. We discussed this during the Khilaf of Uthman radiyanhu. He didn't want somebody to get and to a place where they get too many connections and they start to and start to misuse their power. But Uthman radiyan kept Muawiyah radiyan in his place because of his piety, because of his justice, and because of his uh, excellent method of rule. To show the humbleness of Muawiyah radiallahu anhu, I will mention a hadith, Sahih, where Muawiyah radiallahu was once asked, he said, he was asked, Anta afdal aw Ali? And who is better, you or Ali? Muawiyah radiallahu and this is Abu Muslim al-Qulani uh, who asked this question. Muawiyah radiallahu he said, who am I compared to Ali? Ali, he then mentioned the virtues of Ali radiallahu He didn't tell him, yes, I'm better. 
I mean, today if me and you have a conflict, may Allah protect us all, if somebody asks you who's better, immediately we'll try to find a way to justify us being better. You know, whatever you can find. But Mu'amir Adyan did not. And this shows his humbleness. Instead, he said that, look, Ali, he is the son-in-law of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He is the cousin of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa He was an early Muslim. He became one of the first people to become Muslim. He made hijrah. He went over the virtues of Ali until Abu Muslim, the, the one who asked the question, thought that as if I was sitting in the camp of Ali. But Mu'awiyah radiyan then told him, the only thing is, we want our haqq, which the Qur'an gave to us, we want the killers of Uthman. That's our only disagreement. Otherwise, no doubt Ali Radyan is of more, more virtue than me. Now, I will mention a, a couple of things. Yani, uh, when we talk about Mu'awi Radyan and his virtues, and how what he was asking for, which is the killers of Uthman Radyan, to be handed over for the Qasas to be carried out, for the haqq that Allah has given in the Qur'an to be carried out, Somebody may start thinking ill of Ali radiyanhu and we never want to go there either. We Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, we love Ali radiyanhu, we believe in the fada'il, the virtues of Ali radiyanhu. And I will mention something from a book that I looked up in preparing for these and, and this is why you love the ulama of the past. They, they, in a few words they're able to solve major issues. Al-Hafid ibn Hazm, Al-Andalusi, Al-Zahiri, he has a book called Al-Milal wa Nihal. And in it he says that no doubt Ali radiyan was a haqq for the Khilafah. He goes, but no doubt Mu'awi Radyan was a haqq in his talab. And it's very interesting. He says that Ali Radyan was more deserving to be the Khalifa. That is true. And Mu'awi Radyan was more deserving on what he asked. He goes, but all of them were on haqq. He said that Ali Radyan realized that due to the people he had with him, and many of them being people who were secretly or openly khawarij, that if he tried to fulfill the request of Muawiyah, he would not be able to keep the Ummah together. So what he did was correct. And Muawiyah radiyanhu, seeing the zulm that was done against Uthman radiyanhu, and what he asked for was haqq as well. So we Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah love both of them, and Alhamdulillah we respect all of the Sahaba radiyallahu anhum. Muawiyah radiyanhu, I will mention something going a little bit forward. Right, just to give you an example about the personality of Mu'awiyah radiyanhu, how strong of a person he was. And I tell you, this is, I mean, you will take this lightly, but may Allah protect us. When you get to this stage where he is in this, you will see what it takes to be what, who he was. Mu'awiyah radiyanhu ruled for 40 years, 20 years as a governor, 20 years as a uh, ruler of, I mean, 20 years as a governor of Sham, and then 20 years as a ruler of the whole Ummah, Tayyib. At the time of his death, at the time of his death, he knew he was going to die. And he had, uh, and we'll discuss the suburb of his death later, inshallah. But he knew the physicians, everybody told him, you're going to die. He realized it. So what did he do? He dressed up. He dressed up really well. And he wore his best clothing. And he dyed his beard. And he put the best atar. And he told his guards, let the people come and visit me. Like, don't tell the people, oh no. And he was very sick at the time, he's dying. So he said, let the people come visit me. He says, because I don't want people to think I'm afraid of death. Rather, I am going to dress up nice, and I'm going to smell nice, and I'm going to sit up to greet death. To greet death. Now, I know that sounds easy. But if you think that sounds easy, it's probably because you've never been close to death. If any of you have faced death, may Allah protect us all, then you know that's not easy. You can talk all the talk you want. I used to go to high school. Right? A lot of people would talk. But if somebody busts out with a gun, <laughs> you would see people's personalities change like this. Right? You would see their face change, their, their hands shake, you would see people urinate themselves. You know, all this stuff happens because the body goes into shock. But Mu'awiyah radiyan was a very strong person. He, he knew he was going to die, but he told the people that I'm not afraid of death. I'm going to greet death. He goes, because I lived a life that I was never afraid of death. So I'm not going to die a death of being afraid of death. And 
he wrote some amazing poetry. Don't have time to go in depth there. But those people of Gulu, and those people, as I mentioned, there were those people that went towards Gulu of Mu'awi radiyanhu, and they cursed Ali radiyanhu, and we believe they were off. And there were people who went into Gulu with Ali radiyan and cursed Mu'awi radiyanhu, and we believe they are off. The Ahlul Sunnah, we love both. So those who went into Gulu towards Ali radiyanhu and cursed Mu'awi radiyanhu, Mu'awi radiyan at the time of death, he wrote against them. And he mentioned the Khawarij and others as well, who cursed both. And he told them, he says, look, death has come to me, come and see me now. And I will see how you will handle death. And you can talk all those things behind me, but when death comes to you, then I will see how you will handle death. He says, when death comes, only Allah can make it easy for you, and your ruju is only to Allah. And he goes, when death comes on those cowards, then all their charms, you know what we call taweez and those little bracelets and you know, little, the Arabs have that little eye thing nowadays, little blue eye, ferozi, whatever, right? He goes, all those charms and ambulance will do you no good. He goes, the only thing that will help you is Allah, and this is the only one that can make death easy for you. From the fadail of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, in Sahih Ahadith. And I want to again emphasize, there are many, many weak and fabricated ahadith about the fadail of Muawiyah radiyanhu. And there are many, many weak and fabricated ahadith criticizing Muawiyah radiyanhu. The methodology of this dars and the methodology of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is to stay away from both of those. Rather to stick to what is an authentically established ahadith according to the unified rules. Yani the rules that we use whether we discuss Ali or Muawiyah or Uthman or Abu Bakr radiyallahu anhu. In Sahih Ahadith we find that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, our beloved Prophet, he made dua for Muawiyah radiyallahu He made dua, he said, Allahumma allam al-Muawiyah. Oh Allah, give Muawiyah the ilm of al-kitab wal-hisab. Wa fihi a'adhab, I need to take away from him a'adhab. This is in the fadail of Sahaba of Imam Ahmad, as an authentic narration. The, the sanad in the musnad and the sanad in fadail of Sahaba is Hassan li ghayrihi. Siyar al-alam al-nubala of Imam Dhahabi has a sahih chain of this as well. Ibn Asakir has also has a sahih sanad for this hadith. What does that mean? The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam made dua for Muawiyah radiallahu anhu that Allah gives him the understanding of al-kitab of the Quran and al-hisab which is math or account. And this is something that the ulama have discussed that when he ran Sham, his accounting and his making sure that the ghanima and the zakat is taken and distributed properly and his accounts were excellent. Right? And that's why he didn't have a lot of uh, disputes as well because he was very clear with his accounting. And this shows the dua of Rasulullah sallallahu was accepted for him regarding these two. And the end of the dua, what else did Rasulullah make dua for him? To take him away from the punishment. And it's a dua of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in another hadith that Imam At-Tirmidhi has mentioned, and he has mentioned it to be Hassan, a Shaykh Al-Albani in his Takhrij mentioned it to be Sahih li ghayrihi because he mentioned many other asanid for it. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for Muawiyah radiallahu anhu saying, Allahumma ja'alhu hadiyan wahdi, wahdi bihi. Yani, may Allah guide him and guide others through him. In another narration that Imam al-Bukhari has mentioned uh, in his Tariq al-Kabir, not in his Sahih, but in his Tariq al-Kabir with the Sahih Sanad, with the authentic chain. Imam Ahmad has also mentioned it with the Sahih chain. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam made dua for Muawiyah radiyan saying, Allahumma ja'alhu hadiyan mahdiyan wa wahdu wa wahdi bihi. Yani, may Allah make him guided and upon guidance and make him a means of guidance and, and guide others through him. We see these dua from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, the son of Abbas from the Ahlul Bayt, from the Sahaba of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said as 
a mention in the Musannaf of Abdul Razak, hadith number 20,985. And in the Musannaf, in the Takhreed, it said, huwa jayyid, maqbool, it's authentic narration. Ibn Abbas radiyan said, ma ra'aytu rajulun kana akhlaq, yani min al-muluk, min al-mu'awiyah. He says, I did not see a person from the kings to be of better akhlaq than Muawiyah radiallahu anhu. And he's from Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. When we look at the ulema of this ummah, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal, as mentioned by Al-Khalal in the Kitab As-Sunnah, by Al-Khalal in the second volume, page number 434, he says, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal was asked, who was better, man afdal, Muawiyah or Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? Tayyib, you know Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, right? Famous Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, righteous, known for his piety. So Imam Ahmad was asked, who is better, Muawiyah or Umar ibn Abdul Aziz? Faqal al Ahmad, Imam Ahmad said, Muawiyah. He said, Muawiyah. Because we do not compare anybody to the Ashab al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Yani anybody who was a Sahabi has a greater virtue than anybody that comes after them. So he said, even if Umar al is more famous for his piety and for his rule and things, but Muawiyah was a Sahabi. So he is greater in virtue to us than even Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, because Umar ibn Abdul Aziz was not a Sahabi of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is inshallah the muqaddama and the background and the fadail of Muawiyah radiyanhu. Inshallah next Saturday we'll begin with the actual khilafah and the many jihad uh, yani victories that came during the time of the uh, rulership of Muawiyah radiyanhu. We saw a sad uh, era in our tarikh past. And you have to have rainy days to appreciate sunny days. You have to have harsh times to appreciate good times, you have to have sick days to appreciate health. So you had a harsh time the ummah went through, and there were fitan, and jihad, and the expansion of the Muslim ummah kind of came to a standstill because the Muslims were fighting with each other. Then, due to the sacrifice of Hassan ibn Ali and the wisdom of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan, we saw that the ummah came back together. So now, under the khilaf of Muawiyah radiyanu, we're going to see another happy time. A time without fighting within the Ummah. A time where the Muslim Ummah will start their victories again. Going into Cyprus and going into uh, Turkey and talking about the Fada'il, the virtues of Istanbul and its conquer and its attack. And Muawiyah Radiyan being the one who initiated that. And battles in, in, in Faras and battles against the Romans and victories again in the 20 years of the Khilafah of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan radiallahu anhu. Jazakumullahu khairan.